Today we're going to be learning about how growing is knowing and showing. Everybody say, growing is knowing and showing. So you're going to learn today that when we come to Christ, that we're made new creations. When we're born again, we're really made a new person on the inside, and God wants us to grow up. And when we grow up, what it looks like is us knowing God more and showing the outside world what God is doing to us and through us on the inside. So every one of us here should have a in, inner new man that is growing and showing the world how awesome God is. Now look with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to read the whole passage here, 11 verses. How many can handle 11 verses in the Bible? Y'all can handle the Bible in church? Okay, because well, we're going to read the Bible here, okay? Here we go. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of God our Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as as precious as ours, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So Peter's starting a letter. He's writing to these people. He's telling them who he is. He's like, man, I'm Simon Peter. I'm a servant. That means he's always doing what's right and serving God. And he says, I'm also an apostle of Jesus Christ. And that means he's in charge of some stuff. Apostles start and oversee, excuse me, start and oversee churches. And then he says, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, have received a faith as precious as ours. So how many think Peter had some faith when he walked on water? After Peter betrayed Jesus, how many think he had some faith not to quit and hang himself like Judas, to take his licking and keep on ticking? That took some faith not to give up. Look at your neighbor and say, don't give up. Amen. And then how many believe he had some faith on the day of Pentecost to start the church by preaching and teaching the things of God? Now, guess what? It got to be so awesome with that man's faith that his shadow began to heal sick people. He even saw a dead person raised. Peter began to do awesome things. Sadly, he never became a pope. He was just a disciple like everybody else. He doesn't say Simon Peter, a pope and a pimp. He doesn't say that. Hello? He doesn't say Simon Peter, a man who dresses up like mother and people call him father and he has a funny pointy hat. No, he says Simon Peter, a what? A servant. So what should all disciples be? Servants like Peter and an apostle. And there was many apostles. We know them, Matthew and, and um, John and the others disciples were apostles too. But now watch. It says that you guys have received a faith as precious as ours. So do you think that Peter had some precious faith? Can I hear an amen? Guess what? If you're in Christ today, you've received the precious faith of, of Peter, the same kind of faith. There's not a Peter kind of faith and a your kind of faith and a me kind of faith. No, there's only one kind of faith, and that's a precious faith. And Peter had it, and you have it today. One kind of faith. How many have the faith of Peter today? How many have the faith of Jesus today? You see, because it says, who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received faith as precious as ours. That means you can do in your life whatever God has told you to do, just how Peter did whatever God told him to do. Your life and Peter's life may be different, but you have the same faith to accomplish what God put before you to do. God said for Peter to do these things, and he said, here's the faith that it will take to do it. And Peter said, I receive it, and I'll do it. And God's looking at your life going, hey, I want you to do these things, and here's the faith that you can do it. Can I hear an amen? amen? Now, the next thing is where I love these next verses here. It says, his divine power, talking about Jesus Christ, his divine power has given us everything we need for a what? Godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the what? Divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Here's the question. Have you escaped the world and its evil desires, or are you still caught up in the world, chained up by the devil? I like to say it like this. You were born naughty by nature, but born again in divine nature. If you're still in your naughty nature and have not been born again in the divine nature, you are chained to your own sinful desires. You are chained to the evil within your soul. The temptations you face will overcome you and capture you. But if you call out on Jesus to be born again, as he said in John 3.3, 3, to be born of the Spirit, to have a spiritual life transformation, it's not reincarnation, you don't get a second chance, this is it, you only choose here to serve God, not after death, as everybody 
you with me? Born again happens in this life, and if you are, you are born in the divine nature. Is anybody here in the divine nature? How many of you are still in your naughty nature? No, I'm kidding, but we know some people, don't we? they still naughty. We know some people in traffic, they're still naughty. Maybe somebody has a boss tomorrow they're going to work for them. They're still naughty. Maybe you have an employee or a customer that's naughty. But here's the thing Christ says to us, to be born again in the divine nature and escape the world, escape the flesh, escape your evil desires. And doesn't that sound like Jesus' prayer? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. How many like to see movies where the good guys win? I like to see movies where the good guys win. I put a little review of Batman versus Superman on my Facebook. If you have time, you can look at that. I won't take our time here to do that. But I'll tell you this. I love watching the good guys win. And there's a lot of movies where the good guy has to rescue somebody, right? They have to rescue them. They're caught by the bad guy. The bad guy's going to hurt them. There's going to be just pain and suffering. And then dun, 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 here comes the good guy, right? How many just, come on, how many still have like a child on the inside of them and they love seeing that happen? They love seeing the bad guy get punched, thrown off the cliff or whatever happens. Well, I want to tell you today, Jesus came to rescue from the devil. He came to rescue you from your own evil desires. He came to storm in on that horse and set you free. Do not say today, I am still chained up by the devil and I'm locked up. They won't let me out. Don't keep saying that because Jesus came to let you out. Don't say that you can't stop sinning. Jesus came to rescue you. Come on. That's what it means to live in the divine nature. Now for this reason, because Jesus Christ came to give us a divine nature to have us escape and get away from the evil desires. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Remember, we got precious faith, just like Peter's. No different, same kind of faith. We need to add to that faith goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, everybody say increasing measure. Thank you. They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted in what? Blind, thank you, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their past sins. So is there such a thing as a backslider, somebody that once used to have faith like Peter, believed in God, and then they set it down and go off and do something else? Yes. As the old song goes, I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. You know, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, etc. But you can also go from being see, a seen to going to be blind. You can also go from being found to being lost again. Because if your faith, the, the faith that God gave you is so precious, if you don't increase and add things to that faith, you can die in your spiritual walk. What's not growing in Christianity is dying. What is not living is dead. And I want to ask you today, are there some of you that started off with a precious faith just like Peter? You came to church, you said, I believe in God. I, I believe Jesus is who he said he is. I believe that he loves me, has a plan for my life. But then you forgot and you started doing the things you wanted to, and then you became blind and nearsighted, and all you saw was the world in front of you. You couldn't see past the world into heaven. You couldn't see past your own desires to a marriage, and so you kept hooking up. Hello? You couldn't see past the desires of your flesh, and you kept spending your money instead of tithing, instead of investing in treasures in heaven. So the Bible says you become blind and nearsighted. All you see is this little 70 years and the money that you make, the relationships that you have, and you forget that really was about you being forgiven and having eternal life. There are people like that here today. There's those who have never met Jesus and they will go to hell. And then there are those who have known Jesus and have turned away and they too will go to hell. He says to those, depart from me, I have never known you. And it says on judgment day, they'll say back, but didn't I do all these great things? And he'll say, I don't remember, I don't know you. Because God will forget those who have become unrighteous. Those who have turned their backs on God will suffer a penalty. Can I hear an Amen. I want to show you that their righteous deeds will be remembered no more. Because some of you may say, well, I've been a Christian. I've done righteous deeds. But the Bible says it will be remembered no more. Turn with me to the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel chapter 18. How many want to see it in the Bible? Can I hear an amen? Come on, get excited. It's the Bible. It's tight, but it's right. You may say, oh, me, oh, my, but it's better if you say amen. Come on, somebody say Amen. 
You know what? I'm glad you have a pastor here today that tells you the truth, right? I could tell you you all were millionaires, but you wouldn't like that so much because that would be a lie, right? And you know, I could tell you outside is waiting for you a brand new car, and you would go out there and see your car and be mad at me. Hello. <laughs> I don't want you to take it out on me. i got to tell you what Peter is saying. Some of you have faith as precious as his, but you've lost it. You've become nearsighted and blind. Here's Ezekiel 18, 24. But if a righteous person turns from their righteousness, okay, we know wicked people go to hell, right? That's already obvious. If you don't have Christ, you go to hell. There's a place called hell, my friends. I don't say it lightly, but it is a part of this conversation. You really can't be honest about heaven unless you talk about hell. You can't be honest about good unless you talk about evil. You can't be honest about God upon the earth unless you talk about the work of the devil upon the earth. This is Jesus' language. Jesus always taught this way. Now look at this. If a righteous person turns from their righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things the wicked person does, will they live? Will, will they be blessed? No. None of the righteous things that person has done will be will be remembered because of the unfaithfulness. What's the opposite of faithfulness? Unfaithfulness. You have faith as precious as Peter's when you come to him, when you come to Christ. But if you turn from Christ, you go from being faithful to unfaithful. Because of the unfaithfulness they are guilty of, and because of the same sins they have committed, they will die. You see, they are guilty of unfaithfulness. Today, my friends, you shouldn't walk in fear of losing your salvation like you do your keys. You shouldn't be in fear of losing it like, oh, man, am I not saved anymore? Oh, I made a mistake. Does God not love me? No, we can be confident that God loves us, that he cares for us, because we should be able to look at this Bible and be able to see that we're growing. But those of us who should take heed today of this warning are those who are not growing in this area, these areas. They're making excuses to continue in their sin, and they don't think that it matters very much. See, the one who comes to me and goes, Pastor, I sinned and I don't know what to do about it. See, that, that person that person has a right heart because they, they want to make it right. You know, they're like, I, I, you know, how do I confess my sin? How do I do it right? And I tell them, you know, you pray to God and, you know, God clears their conscience and they feel a peace. I, I love that. But the person who goes, what sin? What, what are you talking about? You mean, you mean God has a problem with me having sex with my girlfriend? You mean God has a problem if I get drunk on the weekends? You mean God has a problem if I lie, steal, if I don't tell the truth? You mean God has a problem if I'm jealous? Come on, everybody's a sinner. You see that person, it's like, hey, bing, 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 bing. You're having, you're, you're having trouble right now. And if you're not careful, you will be judged with the wicked. You'll be judged with the wicked. Isn't that what it says? See, we know the wicked are judged. Everybody goes, hey, everybody knows Hitler's going to hell or he's already there, right? We, we know that. We know ISIS is going to hell if they die. We know that that false religion doesn't lead to heaven. But what about, what about Mr. Goody Two-Shoes that now just starts making some compromises, living detestable just like the wicked? What happens to them? And so what we need to understand is that the growing faith, the living act of faith, is the natural faith. God hasn't called you to be unfaithful. If you don't do these seven things and you mess up, ask God to forgive you. That's the benefit of being a Christian. It's forgiveness. Forgiveness is the benefit of a Christian, not a sinner who keeps wanting to get out of jail free card. Well, I'll commit a crime because my dad's the governor. He'll get me out. I'll commit a crime because my dad's the policeman. He won't arrest me. I'll commit a crime because my dad's the warden. He'll unlock the jail cell and let me come out. No, that's not the way it's supposed to be with you and God. You're supposed to say, because my God is the warden, I don't want to go to the jail where he has to take care of bad people. Because my God is like the governor, I don't want to give him a bad reputation among his citizens. Because my God is the king of kings, I will live holy and be Christ-like. I will walk worthy of my calling. And if I mess up, I'll be the first to repent. Christians shouldn't be hypocrites. That, that shouldn't even be a word said among us. Because whenever a Christian sins, we should be the first to go, oh, I'm sorry. That's right. The Bible says don't do that. I did it. And the Bible says now I should say I'm sorry for doing that and truly change. Christians should be the ones setting forth the standard on their job. Let's say you had, you had a work uh, assignment and you didn't get it done on time. You don't lie. You don't say you were sick over the weekend. You tell your boss, my fault. Didn't do what I was supposed to. I got caught up on something else. Will you forgive me? See, bosses will start thinking differently of Christians on the job, won't they? Let's say you're doing customer service and that customer came to you and they're yelling at you and they shouldn't be yelling, but you got to smile and be nice to them. And instead of deleting their account and saying, well, I ain't doing nothing for you, you need to remember your training and go, oh, yeah, that was a mistake the company made. 
will you, will you forgive us? Our company should have, shouldn't have done that. We put an extra a month cycle on your bill for this month. That's why you're charged twice. So many times I talk to people in the service industry, when they make mistakes, they can't even say they're sorry. And the best they'll say is, well, the company made a mistake. You see, that is terrible. We should be able to take ownership for our companies and go, we're sorry, or just say, I'm sorry, the company made the mistake. You see, that will show a true Christianity in this world. Hello? Husbands and wives should show each other true Christianity. This is just a freebie. I'm still in the intro to the introduction. Amen? Amen. We should be able to say to our husbands and wives, I'm sorry. We should show Christianity in our families instead of trying to tear each other down, prove who's really wrong, who's really in control. We should be the ones to say, I'm sorry, forgive me. I should love you as Christ loves the church, or I should submit to you as the church submits to Christ. Because if we don't do these things, I'm going to say it again, for whoever possesses these qualities in increasing measure, they, uh, whoever, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. If you find yourself slipping away from Christ and you're no longer effective or productive in your knowledge of Jesus, something is wrong. Because if you don't do them, you're nearsighted and blind, forgetting that you've been forgiven of your sins. I don't want to forget that I was forgiven of my sins. I don't want to forget that I was once a sinner lost. I want to be reminded of that and walk humbly before the Lord. And if I were to sin, to know the same God that saved me is the same God that can forgive me. Amen? Therefore, my brothers and sisters, now let me put it all together. He starts off this introduction here. He says he's Simon Peter, a servant, an apostle, that uh, he and the disciples there have the same faith and that they have been given divine power to live a godly life and that they have the divine nature on the inside of them and they're to add these seven things into their spiritual walk and avoid being blind and unproductive he now says therefore my brothers and sisters make every effort to confirm your calling and election for if you do these things you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ how many think Peter was lying here when he said you'll never stumble or do you think he was telling us the truth Literally, if you do the seven things Peter said for you to do, you will never stumble. When is it I stumble when I don't do those things? Is it possible for me to have those seven things in my faith actively growing in my life and for me to stumble? No, it's impossible. That's what Peter said. And he said, you have no different of a faith than me. Because he knew some people, everybody look up at me, please. He knew some people would be in a church like this going, well, that's easy, pastor. You've got great faith. You've been doing this a while. Or Peter, that's easy for you, Mr. Spiritual Smarty Pants. You walked on water. Who can really do what Peter does? Come on, guys. We're, we're never going to be as good as Peter. And Peter's like, no. You have faith as precious as mine. And you've been given divine power just like I've been given divine power. And yeah, you were naughty in nature just like I was born naughty in nature. But you've been born again in the divine nature. And here's the spiritual growth tips of heaven. These seven things. And if you do them, you'll never ever stumble. So are you tired of stumbling? I'm tired of stumbling. What thing do you want to keep stumbling over right now? What, what thing have you just given up on going, well, I'm cool if I stumble over that. I'm cool. I'm cool with pornography every now and then. You know, I'm cool with it. Yeah, I'm cool with not giving tithe every now and then because God knows. God knows I need it. You know, I'm cool with being bitter towards people who really hurt me because they deserve it. Yeah, I'm cool with that. I'm cool, right? What thing have we, what, what, what little compromises have we made? And just go, oh, I'm cool with stumbling. I'm cool with it. I'm okay. See, I'm tired of stumbling. How many of you ever stubbed your toe before? How many want to do that again? <laughs> Dude, if they could put that in a pill and give that to people to torture them, that would have the, all of ISIS tell us where the bad guys are. Ah, oh, they're over here. They're in Baghdad. Bomb them or whatever. Dude, it is the worst feeling in the world. I, I don't care how big and strong of a man you are. When that little toe hits the side of your bed frame, when that thing gets hit by the door or something, you are screaming like a child. You are on the floor. You are crying out for mercy, help. And you know what? I'm t- I don't want to do that again. I don't, I don't in my life right now, I don't ever want to stub my toe again. How many have ever stumbled and fallen in public before? Either in the mall, you know, at a grocery store. You're just walking. Poof, poof. How many have ever done it on the sidewalk? Oh, my gosh. I did it the other day, and I just tried to play it off. I'm, like, I'm good. Hurts a little bit, but I'm good. I'll just keep walking to the post office right now. Dude, I felt like, Boom. It hurts. It ain't fun, dude, especially like if you're wearing sandals like chunk lugs and your ankle gives out and the thing flips up like that. You know what I'm talking about. See, boom. Oh, my goodness. Do you want to do that again? 
Like, do you want, like, is there a part of you that says, yeah, I just want to play sports with my friends and trip and fall in front of everybody? Or ladies, yeah, I want to be the one coming up to get married and stumble and trip on my dress. That would be neat. You've seen the videos, right? Like, of course now, we don't want to stumble. So do we want to stumble in life? I mean, let's, make, let's, let's be serious now. Do we want to show our kids our stumbles? Do we, want to watch, do we want our kids to watch us just stumble with a potty mouth the whole time and then bring that to school and get in trouble and then they got to explain why they know those words? It's because mommy and daddy say it when they get mad. Hello. Do, do we want this kind of life where we hand to our kids where we say, do as I say but not as I do? What Peter is teaching us here today is that there's a true change of nature when you're born again and that then there is a true change of behavior as you continue to grow in your faith. And I just want to know today, is there anybody who wants to grow in their faith? Can I hear an amen? Come on, say amen. Do you want to grow up? I want to grow up. Look at this introduction here today. Spiritual growth should be as natural to the Christian as apples are to a healthy apple tree. When you see the apple tree growing, you don't hear it struggling like, oh, it's so hard, it's so hard, oh, and here comes a branch, and then the little apple comes out, oh, pop, and then there's an apple. No, you just, if you have a fruit tree in the back of your house or at the park and you walk by it and see it regularly, it, it just grows naturally. Right now it starts to bud, and then the, the leaves will start to come out, and, and then you'll start to see the fruit come on there, you know, and it's just natural. The Christian life should be like that. We shouldn't be being choked out by the devil. We shouldn't have our roots all sticking out, being all crooked, and be like, God still loves me, you know, just the way I am, all messed up. No, we should be healthy and naturally growing in our marriages, naturally growing with our children, naturally. Everybody say naturally. The healthy child doesn't need to force themselves to grow, and the Christian shouldn't either. I mean, literally, every time I put Zoe down for a nap, it's like she grows a little bit more, a little bit more, because it's natural for healthy things to grow. And you know what? We should grow as a deep, uh, grow in our love for Jesus as a disciple, and we should see that God is leading us to good pastures and pruning us whenever something bad is growing, because how many people know weeds can grow pretty fast too? And weeds can sometimes grow faster than the garden vegetables, right? Those of you who are doing gardens, I know Adam's mom has like an amazing garden in her backyard with all those spices and oregano, those fresh herbs. Well, guess what? A weed could grow faster than that. So if you start seeing a bad attitude, you need to ask God to prune that out of you. Take that out so that you continue to grow and bear good fruit. Now let's look at the seven things that Peter told us to do. Here are those seven things in review that Peter told us to look at and to see are always growing in our life. Everybody say goodness. Thank you. Goodness is to be good according to the Bible. So add to your faith goodness. Now let me just make sure I got a people here that believe in God. If you believe in God, can I hear amen? Amen. Okay, so you got faith. How many got faith here? Okay, so if you've got faith, you've got it as precious as Jesus' faith, as precious as Peter's. Look at it. Knowledge. Somebody say knowledge. That means to continue to study your word, to grow in the knowledge of God. If I ask some of you, you sports fans right now, tell me the starting lineup for the Cubs or the White Sox, tell me their next home game, etc. You would name it off, you know, where are the Bulls at in the playoffs, whatever. You'd be able to tell me that. But if I ask some of you right now, what is the scripture in the Bible that helps you get over depression? Would you know a scripture to get you over depression? If I said, give me a scripture that helps you get over uh, problems in your family, arguments. Give me a scripture, right? Would you even know the answer to the problems of your life? You better study the words. Let me say study. Thank you. Self-control means to not be addicted to anything earthly. You shouldn't be addicted to sex. You shouldn't be addicted to food. You should have self-control, and God gave you that control. Perseverance, never give up. How many know you make the choice to give up? How many know you can make the choice not to give up? You ever had doubts before? Have you ever doubted your doubts? You need to learn how to doubt your doubts. You need to learn how to quit your quit. You can. Maybe a little doubt comes in your mind. Well, maybe going to church really don't do anything. You need to doubt that. Maybe me thinking about not going to church, not doing anything, is not a good thing to think about. <laughs> Have you ever doubted your doubts? Man, maybe, maybe, maybe reading the Bible doesn't work. Man, maybe thinking about not reading the Bible, not working, doesn't work. Hello, doubt your doubts. Doubt your doubts and quit your quit. Godliness. What do you think is more scandalous, for Jesus to say that you're saved or Jesus to say that you're godlike? See, I think godliness is even more scandalous than salvation. 
Let me just talk to you about the scandal of the gospel here for a little bit because I don't think you understand the word godly. Because so many want, want to be like Lady Gaga. So many people want to be like Donald Trump. So many people want to be like the next superstar. Everybody wants to be like somebody rich and famous now. Somebody wants to be like the next person that everybody looks up to. But how about being like God? How about being like him? How about having power but having control of it? How about having humility? How about being godly? Now, here's the scandal of the gospel. We're brought up in a generation. We're brought up that if you don't earn it, if you don't work for it, you don't deserve it. So people look at homeless people all the time and go, man, they don't deserve it. They, if they wanted it, they would work like me. Come on, somebody. We grow up in a generation where it's like that company closes, they deserve to close. They don't do it as good as Johnny's. You know, that hot dog stand, they try to do it like Johnny's. They can't do it like Johnny's. They can't make it like Jamie's. We're, we're like, you deserve to close. But you know what? The gospel is so scandalous. God says you deserve wrath, but I'm going to still give you mercy. You deserve to fail. You deserve to go to hell. You deserve to be punished. But I'm going to save your little sorry behind. I'm going to, no, listen. He said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't, he didn't save you when you smelled all good. He didn't save you when you looked all clean for church. He saved you in your most dark, darkest, deepest pit of wickedness when you stank like the devil. Jesus said, I love them. Devil, you can't have them. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, that's scandalous right there. You're thinking right now God's that guy at, at Michigan Avenue sending, selling you that fake Rolex. That's because I'm telling you, that's a scam, isn't it? Hey, man, I got a Rolex. How much? Ten bucks. Oh, really? No, come on. That's fake. You know it's fake because you don't get a Rolex for ten bucks. And some of you, you hear this. You hear that Jesus saves sinners, and you're like, no, there's got to be some strings attached. What do I got to do, Jesus? Do I got to pray seven times a day? Do I got to give all my money to church? God, come on. You, you just don't give stuff away to sinners, do you, Jesus? Because then any old sinner could get saved. You must only save real good sinners, people who work at it and then really impress you, right, God? You, you're like that father that doesn't like me unless I win the game, so you, you're going to pick me and choose me if I win, right? Then you'll like me and say, good job, son. No, 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 see, you don't get it. See, the scandal of the gospel, the scandal of it, the thing that's a mystery is that God says to all of us as sinners, I choose you, not because of any righteous thing you have done, but because I am love. God says, I am love. And we come to the cross, not with our trophies saying, pick me, please. We, we don't come with our singing an American Idol and say, vote for me. No, we, we come with our wickedness and say, do you still want me? Then forgive me because I can't save myself. That's how we come. Now, what is the bigger scandal? That he loves us and saves us? Or that now he loves us and says, now you can be God-like. See, because he takes it to a whole nother level. But what is the scandal within the scandal is that he goes, I'm not finished yet. I'm going to teach you a prayer. You're going to pray to my Father, and you're going to glorify his name, and then you're going to say, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. You see, God wants godly people on this earth so that his kingdom can come. I think that's the greatest scandal, the greatest mystery I'll ever understand, is that he didn't just save me and leave me out in the front yard and say, you'll just be my pet. He saved me and said, I'm going to make you just like me. I'm going to make you just like my son, Jesus. I'm going to have you be like me. So when you hear that word godly, don't you forget what that means. It means like God. Amen. Can I hear an Amen. And that's why we now can have brotherly love to treat others as we want to be treated. And then lastly, love itself, the greatest attribute of God. We now have the opportunity to add these seven things to our life. Goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. Because if we do these things in increasing measure, we will never stumble. How many want to increase and grow? Look at your neighbor and say, that was just the introduction. Okay, let's get ready to preach today. How many want the message now? Come on. How many want it? That's the introduction. Here it is. Here it is. Simply said, how do you grow? As easy as one, two, three. Number one, you got to believe in Jesus. you got to believe he is who he said he is. The Bible says he is our great God and Savior. Who here believes today that Jesus is your great God and Savior? 
You see, then by definition, you are saved. You have faith. If you don't believe that, you need to doubt your doubts. You need to study the word. You need to come to a place you submit yourself and say, he is Lord and I am not. But for those of us who believe that, I want to ask you the next question. Do you believe what Peter said, that you've been given everything you need for a godly life and that you are a partaker in the divine nature? Does any Christian believe that today? How many Christians believe it? Can I hear an amen? Oh, come on. Do you believe it? And then how many believe now you can do what Jesus said you can do? That you can add these seven things to your faith. How many believe goodness is not something that's so far out of your reach that you can't do it now? How many believe that godliness is not impossible? How many believe that these things are now possible with Christ and that you really don't have to keep walking around in darkness, stumbling on things, hurting yourself and others and not knowing what to do about it? How many believe you can add these attributes of faith to your life? Now, if you believe that, you have to remember these two things, that number one, your spiritual nature and identity is not the same as your spiritual maturity and growth. And here's just the way I want you to see this. When you were born again, you were born again the right way. Christ changed you on the inside. That is now your nature. That's your nature. You were born naughty by nature, but born again in divine nature. And then that's who you are. You are a child of God. You are a saint. You're no longer a sinner. Can I show you that? Can somebody say, show it to me? I'd love to show it to you. Come on, turn with me right now to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 1. Look at what Paul said. Look at what Paul said about the Christians that were among him at that time. He said that they were sanctified. I, I have it from here. Thank you, my brother. Look at 1 Corinthians, chapter 1. Look at it as, Peter, as Paul rather writes to these Christians, and look at what he says to them. First, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brothers, the Thosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those who are what? Sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at this. That word right there, called to be his holy people. Look at it, what it says in another translation, those of you who are used to the old school world word saints. Look at it. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, that was a city. To those who are what? Sanctified, past tense, cleansed from sin. That big word sanctified means you're cleansed from sin in Christ Jesus. Called to be what? What are you called to be? We may be Bears fans, but we're what? Saints. Come on, somebody. I used to live in New Orleans. I had to say a little New Orleans joke there. Okay. We're Bears fans, but we are saints. That's what God called you to be. Are you a saint or an ain't? Come on. I might need to go a little southern on you right now, but I got to get some, get some knowledge to you. Because if you ain't a saint, then you're just making excuses to stay a sinner. Well, God said I could live holy. I ain't doing that. God commanded you to wait until you get married, right? I ain't doing that to have sex. I ain't doing that. So are you a saint or an ain't? God said, read your Bible and pray. I ain't doing that. Y'all get the joke now. Are you a saint or a ain't? Uh, what are you? Come on. Don't tell God you ain't doing that. Pardon my English, Chicagoans. I know you all sophisticated up here. <laughs> but don't tell God you an ain't. You, an, you can be who God called you to be. Believe that you're a saint. When you came to Christ, that's who you were. But the difference is, and this is not hypocrisy. Listen, this is not hypocrisy. But the difference is between our nature and our maturity is that we don't always act like who we are. My son is a Wyrostic, but he doesn't always act like a Wyrostic. Uh, I think just last Wednesday in, in King's Kids, he got a timeout because he came on the stage wanting to be like his dad. You can't blame him. Wanting to be a preacher. But then they said, get off the stage. And he probably did something sassy like, come get me, you know, and run around. And that got him a timeout. Now, he is a Wyrostic by very nature. You can't get more Wyrostic than him. He, I mean, does him and I look alike? What do you think? If you have seen my son, right? He is of my flesh. He is of my DNA. His nature is done. It is complete. He is a Wyrostic. No changing that now. No X-Men, no morphine around here. Amen? No, no, no nuclear waste is going to change him into the it or whatever, the swamp thing. He is my son. My son. But he doesn't always act like it. Here's the thing, Christians are Christians, born again, made like God, changed in their nature, but don't always act like it. The hypocrisy is when they don't confess it. The hypocrisy is when you don't stay accountable. The hypocrisy is, is when you say, I don't make mistakes, and everybody around you can see that you are doing those wrong things. And so what do I try to do as a pastor? What, what, what does a pastor do by definition? 
What does the pastor do? The pastor, by definition, sets an example of what a Christian looks like. That's what I'm supposed to do. Have there been mistakes in my life? Yes, but what have I set an example of? Apologizing and repenting for my mistakes. Does everybody get that? What does a father do? What does a mother do? They set the example to their children as a Christian. And then they, if they make a mistake, they apologize. And then the next thing I want you to see is that big word, sanctification. Everybody say sanctification. Thank you. It means freedom from sin and being made holy. It's not the same as your transformation, living free from sin and acting holy. Everybody say sanctification and transformation. Two different things. See, my son will transform as he grows to become more like his daddy if he wants to be a preacher and he'll get on the stage when he has permission and he'll get off when he's supposed to get off, right? And he'll listen to his mommy and he'll go to Bible college and if he wants to be a preacher, he'll do the things I had to do, right? That, is, that you will see, those of you in this church, as time goes on, I would love to see 20 years from now that young boy preaching. How many would like to see that? Amen? If he wants to be something else, that's fine. But I'm just going to tell you, I'd be really excited if he's a preacher, okay? Because you know what? You know what? Uh, uh, being a preacher is a little bit hard, and I want my son working with me. I look at these guys, father and son, you know, doing these reality shows together. Like there was a pawn show, you know, Pawn Stars. And I see these father and sons. I'm like, oh, I want to do that with Lucas so bad. I want to do that with Lucas, little Lucas. We go preach. You ready to go preach? You know, anyways. And every, every father has, and, and, you know, mother has dreams for their kids. And I'm okay with anything he does. But you get the point here. The transformation of your life is different from the sanctification. The sanctification is that instantaneous thing that God did. He sanctified you. Another word similar to that is justified you. Another word is redeemed. He cleansed you. He, he changed you. That's, that's really what God is saying to us in those passages. But when he talks to us as he does in 2 Peter through, through this passage here, he's saying, but your transformation goes on throughout your life. It is not that you're trying to become a better person. It's that you're learning to be the person God already made you to be. Can I show you that in the Bible? Amen. Come on. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. How many masterpieces do I have in the church today? How many new people know this Bible verse? Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Look at it. I'm going to show you in a modern translation, the New Living Translation. For we are God's masterpiece. What are you? Now, I don't want to be vulgar, but people will look at you sometime, sometimes and go, you are a piece of Blink. Hello. But is that what God calls you? No, he says you are a masterpiece. What does that word literally mean in the English? Just think about that. You are the master's piece. You, you, you have been the work of a da Vinci. You have, you have become the painting of a Van Gogh. You are a piece that belongs to a master. Now watch. For we are God's masterpiece. We are. Christians living today as saints, not dead. We don't become saints when we die. We become saints when we become born again. We don't become divine in our nature, sharing in godliness when we're in heaven. We do it now upon the earth. See, we are God's workmanship or masterpiece here. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the things he planned for us long ago. So am I trying to now do good things so that Christ will now say, you're my masterpiece? Or am I made God's masterpiece to do good things? A, let's go A or B here, okay? A says, I'm junk, but I'm going to keep doing good things, and one day God will point to me and say, you're a masterpiece. Or B, does God say, masterpiece, you called on my name, I've changed you, and now he says, now do good things. A or B? B. So when we look at spiritual growth, what is spiritual growth really all about? Spiritual growth is really these concepts that we need to just put in simple terms. Spiritual growth is knowing and showing. Knowing and showing. Here's the definition of spiritual growth. The process of transformation by which the disciple increases in their knowledge of God and shows it by living holy. Get this example. Every time the believer learns something new about God as it pertains to his will for their life and lives it out, they grow and transform. And so we're going to remember that transformation is not becoming a better person, but rather acting like the person Jesus already made us to be. First, Christians are made God's masterpiece, and second, they do his works. 
Another example is to think about Jesus, the perfectly virgin-born Jesus. How many love Jesus? How many believe he was born perfect? But the Bible says he grew in wisdom and in stature. He didn't come out of his mother's womb as a grown man. <sighs> Hello, Mary, here I am. How many are glad he didn't do that to Mary? <laughs> Hello? He came out as a baby. Sweet baby Jesus. And then he grew up to little adolescent Jesus. Then he grew up to preteen Jesus. Acne Jesus, right? Then he became teenage Jesus. His voice was changing Jesus. And then he became young man Jesus. And then he became manly Jesus. And he never sinned. And he grew in his wisdom. And he grew in his body. And the Bible says that's our example because when we were born again, we were born again with a perfect spirit. When Jesus made us anew, did we get a sinful spirit? Were we born again, again a sinner? Or were we born again now a saint? You were born first time as a sinner. You don't get born again a sinner again. You get born again a saint. How many like to see that in the Bible? I just should just show you the Bible without asking if you want to see it. But I want to see if anyone's excited because I'm excited. Go to Hebrews. Hebrews. It is not about a brewery, by the way. If you ever listen to the word Hebrews, nobody. I don't think anybody got that. Nobody get, Did anybody get it? Like my, the peanut gallery here, my side sect. Amen corner. It's not about a brewery. Hebrews. What do you do at a brewery? You brew beer? Hebrew. I should have just, my face is so red right now. That's why I don't tell jokes. If you ever listen to Moody Radio, like they tell jokes, those pastors are always telling jokes. Those Baptist guys got good jokes. Us Pentecostals, we just sweat and yell a lot. Love Jesus, Jesucristo, fuego, fuego. Amen. You know, when I start speaking Spanish, the Espiritu Santo has come. The Espiritu Santo is here. Ahora, when I start speaking Spanish, it won't make a lot of sense, but it does to me. My corazón, it feels so right. Look at this. To the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. Does anybody have their name written in heaven? Is heaven expecting you? Have you been born again? And they go, yep, Joe I. Rostick, November 5th, 1995, we made your reservation. Did God write your name in heaven? That's what happens when you get born again, right? Now look, you have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. How did God make our new spirits? Perfect. Go to John chapter 3, verse 3. Vinny, would you come and help me close it out? Look at John chapter 3, verse 3. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're what? Born again. How are we born again? By the Spirit. It says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to what? Spirit. And so we see that our spirits, according to Hebrews 12, 23, are born again what? Born again perfect. Somebody say perfect. How's your spirit born again? Perfect. That's what spiritual birth is, right? A perfect new you. Do you always live like it? Do you always live like you're perfect? No, so you need to grow up. You need to grow up before Jesus throws up. Can I show you that scripture? I'm going to get sassy. Can I get a little sassy before we go? You got to grow up before Jesus is going to throw up. There's like a gospel preacher on the inside of me. Sometimes that got to come out. Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. I know sometimes i got to confuse people. They're like, he's white, but he preaches black, and he speaks Spanish. What's going on with him? I have no idea. I haven't figured it out. I'm unique. I'm special. <laughs> Look at this. Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 16. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about ready to spit you out my mouth. You see, that's why we got to grow up before God throws up. The growing up means we don't stay lukewarm. We don't stay where we're at. We keep growing. We know that Jesus loves us, but we don't use it as an excuse to sin. We show Jesus back that we love him by doing what he commands. We show our love for him by obeying him. How many remember that's in the Bible? Well, can I show you? Oh, man, I'm going to be here for a minute. Can I show you a couple more scriptures? Look at 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, it says, Those who love him truly are the ones who keep his commands. The ones who say they love him but do not keep his commands are a liar. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's 1 John 2, 4. But anyone, somebody say, I'm an anyone. Come on, but anyone who obeys his word, love for God, is truly made complete in them. 
You want to know what that word complete means? How many people want to guess what that means? It means perfect. Look at it right here. Whoever keeps his word truly, lo- uh, whoever, but whoever keeps his word truly, the love of God is what? Perfected in them. You have been made perfect by love. Now it's time for you to love God perfectly. I'm going to say that again. Perfect love has made you a new person. Jesus had perfect love for you. He did the will of God. Remember he was there at the Garden of Gethsemane? The pressure and stress that was on him. Think about how much pressure was on him that he sweat blood. He's a real man, y'all. He's the God man, but he did not come in God-like power as Superman. He came as a man. He humbled himself as God and took on our sufferings to feel what it would feel like. He was under so much stress, he sweat blood, and they say it's medically possible to do that. He sweat blood. He cries out to the Father. He sees what the cross is going to be like. He cries out. He says, Father, if there's another way, I'll do it because, you know, this is going to hurt. And, you know, let me know. But nonetheless, not my will, but your will be done. So perfect love made us perfect, made us born again. Our spirits were made perfect. And now God is saying to us, do you want to love him perfectly? And when we don't, he still loves us. It's okay. My son doesn't always love me perfectly. I feel like I have it more together than he does. How many parents can relate to that? You love them in a more perfect way than they love you. They can love you very perfectly at like 3 a.m. when they're sleeping sound asleep. That's like the most beautiful moment ever. Oh, they're just so perfect. They're so perfect. Look at them. But how many know 3 in the afternoon, it ain't so perfect? It ain't so perfect. That's when I hear my wife homeschooling in the basement all the way upstairs, two floors. Up. Ah, I can hear her all the way up there. And I'll just send her a little text. Peace be still. <laughs> I am so serious. Peace be still, send. And then I'll hide my phone because I'm like, I don't want to see what she sends back. I'm going to go hide somewhere in the bathroom because I don't know what day it is today. Let's keep it real. So, yeah, we don't always act like who we are. But perfect love has been given to us, so let's love perfectly. Let's not make an excuse for our weakness, our doubts, and our inability to love him. We can when we truly want to. And so now what is faith? Faith is that gift that grows. Mankind cannot choose, excuse me, mankind cannot choose faith unless God freely gives it by his grace first. No sinner can save themselves on their own merit. Jesus has to save them. But yet, he gives us a choice whether or not we want to be saved. Can I give you some attributes of faith in closing? Hebrews 11.1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Choose faith and choose to grow in your faith. Can I tell you the necessity of faith? It is impossible to please God without faith because the one who comes to God must first believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So why are we adding these things to faith? See, look at what it says here. Remember, we have the faith as precious as Peter. And then it says, look right here. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your what? Faith. Why are we adding things to our faith? Because faith can grow. See, all of us have precious faith like Peter. But probably all of us haven't grown our faith like Peter's. See, there's the mic drop moment right there. Isn't that good? Let's keep it real. See, that's why... Today, Peter is saying, you have faith just as precious as mine, but you better add to your faith and grow your faith if you want it to do what mine does. So you want to do what Peter did? Do what, uh, you want to have what Peter had in his life with faith? Do what Peter did. Add these things to your life. Don't get discouraged. Just say, Lord, help me to grow. Everybody say, help me to grow, Jesus. And that's where in closing, I want you just to see those things. And be honest with yourself right now, in closing, we're getting ready to go. Come on, right here. Where do you need to grow? Where are the areas of your life right now where you would be honest and say, my faith is lacking in those ways? Some of us men have seen the guys who always do upper body but no legs. Got little skinny chicken legs. See, there may, there may be some of you here today, you're like, I'm knowledgeable. I know the Bible. I know the Bible. But you ain't good with the Bible. You're mean to everybody. There are some of you here today, you're like, man, I am never giving up. I'm never giving up. But you hate people. You get angry all the time. You don't have brotherly love. There's others of you here today that say, man, I come to church. I read my Bible. I'm always going to live for Jesus. But you can't control your diet. You can't control your addictions. God is saying, grow up. Be transformed. 
it's cool to give a baby a bottle, but it ain't cool when you give a grown man a bottle, right? It's cool to change diapers on a baby. It ain't cool to change your best friend's diapers, right? I mean, if they're healthy. I'm not talking about people who have been hurt in life or, you know, handicapped. I'm being honest. You know, you're healthy. If I just said, come change my diaper, isn't that gross? But isn't that how some Christians live? And so I wanted to take time, and it is kind of like a second introduction here, because I wanted us to really understand what these seven things are and why it's so important. Our faith should be growing. God says it's impossible to please him without that faith, and God has given it to us, so there's no excuse. And I know when I look at this list, instantly things pop out.